today, aren't we? Right. Yes, we are. Okay. We are now recording, so sorry about that, everyone. And let's get the slides back up. Okay. So, yes. So this is this is going to be focusing on open textbooks and OERs and having a sort of a, a replay, but also a kind of a, a new discussion, really, with some great questions that we've got lined up for our panel members, um, Dara and Lorna. Um, and um, yeah, that will take up most of the session. Hopefully, there'll be time for you to ask questions as well and we're really looking forward to it yep okay so should we get started let's with get our started copyright let's, let's news. Go through. so uh news. no well we're just going to do a quick since we last met of yes. course um uh, so what's been what's been happening um i spent uh i was in oxford where i work on monday at the thatcher education center so there's a picture of me uh of course not the first time actually you've been in the presence of no um, indeed because i grew up in finchley i grew up in my, that's where i grew up she was our local constituency mp so and did you do a morris dance i once did a country dancing for margaret thatcher so um i was remembering that reminiscing um but yeah a slightly uh a juxtaposed uh, image there as well of of us with lucy and eddie who, they may join us they, they may at some point um, some people might have met them at ice pops yeah, yeah, and we've we've kind of got them on our mind. There's something in the pipeline, isn't there? there that, is. that will come clearer there later. Is. There so is. we don't need to say much more about. about no, about we don't. Them. But they're still no. here. They're, no, they're, still no, hanging they're, they're, they're hanging around. We're trying to keep them quiet, actually, because mm. the constant chatter about copyright just yeah. worse than us. So. OK, next up is just a reminder um, about the um, the, the blog um, archive of all the webinar recordings. And if you miss any sessions, just to let you know that these sessions will all go up onto the Alt YouTube channel as well. So today's session will be available um, fairly quickly, usually by Monday yeah. um, on the Alt YouTube channel. But you can see the full listing of the webinars, um, which I think Chris is going to put in the chat, are you? Um, no, no, I won't. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's not going to. Right, I think everyone knows where that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's get going with our next item, which is copyright news, 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 copyright news. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'll take us through a bit of this copyright news. I think. You should. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's loads, loads of things that we thought we'd like to share with you. The first thing um, was we were really delighted to have a blog post that we put up this week um, from Katie Wise, who um, attended Ice Pops. Um, she is um, not a copyright person, um, so she is a library assistant, um, and she's, but she's actually one of the new professionals on the Information yeah. Literacy Group Committee. And um, we were really delighted to be able to offer her a place at the conference. And she came along and she shared um, what she calls some of the flavors of copyright um, with her reflections on attending the conference. And in particular, a question she asked the panel at the end, our expert panel, um, about what um, new professionals needed to know about copyright mm -hmm. and how they keep themselves up to date and things like that. So really great to see um, that post from Katie. and. Um, it was lovely to meet her at the conference. Um, next up was um, the uh, new story that I expect many of you have been following um, about um, Wiley's ebook titles that were removed um, from their collection. Um, I think this happened at some time at the end of August, yeah. um, and it's um, been certainly. Um, doing the rounds on on Twitter and on some of the mailing lists about the problems that this is concerned, this is this has caused, and also to sort of um, to encourage people to have a look at whether some of their academics and their authors have had their titles removed as well, um, because um, obviously you know it's important for people um, to know what's happening to books that they're writing for students that they think are available. Um, there's a little bit of a, a kind of, I guess, hot off the press news that came out with a press release from Wiley just mm -hmm. earlier this week. So if you haven't picked this up yet, um, that Wiley have now said well, that, that after quite a bit of pressure on social media um, and through sort of lobbying them, um, that they are working to restore access to the ebooks as soon as possible. Um, they're saying that the materials will remain in the collection through to June 2023. Um, so 
I think it's a watch this space actually of what happens. I know um, acquisitions, librarians, collection development people have been very um, concerned about this. So um, I think we have to keep a, a watching brief, but very relevant to the topic we're going to be talking about today, which is um, is is obviously related to, to, to that when we talk about the, the idea of open textbooks as a potential alternative. Absolutely. Um, so the next one is a webinar that the Knowledge Rights 21 uh, project is running, and that's on the 26th of October. Um, and it is uh, book digitization, online access and lending. As far as I can tell, the, the, we're talking about that very topic of the ebook, um, SOS ebook crisis, as well as controlled digital lending mm. and all of those questions that people are, are looking at now about how can copyright law either flex or be interpreted to support uh, providing access to materials. So that will be an interesting one to see where that project has got to. So the link to that is there. Excellent. Um, and then um, another item I just thought was worth picking up, um, World Culture. There's actually a podcast, I think, by that same title as well. Mm -hmm. But this is a, a book that's been published by um, a, an author, um, Glyn Moody, who writes um, yeah, quite a bit in the uh, this sort of copyright digital collection sort of space um, this book is actually available for a free download as well so you can get a PDF you can also get an EPUB version um, and we've just popped the link in um, there um, but as it, it's described as it's a journey behind the copyright bricks it's um, it's certainly a book um, I'm looking forward to reading um, and I have been following the, the the podcast by the same title which has had interviews with some really interesting people um ceo of creative commons was one i really enjoyed Catherine as well Steiner, yeah yeah and yeah. cory doctorow and yeah 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 so great a great um read um which i'm looking forward to and then um kind of on the topic of reading um i um i've been i'm actually working on a, a piece to write up a study that i did last year on student reading preferences during the pandemic um, and while I was doing that um, and doing a bit of the literature review searching um, came across um, the article um, that was published very recently in the journal of the association for learning developers in higher education which is all about uh, student uh, sort of perceptions of reading online. It's not specifically during the pandemic, that study, but it is a really interesting read and kind of got some implications at the end for what people who work as learning developers do. I was interested in it from the perspective of what we do as uh, librarians and educators. Um, We've got a quote from the second article haven't we? We have yeah. Um, the second article is actually by um, a good friend of mine. I've been collaborating with Diane Mizraki who's at UCLA um, and Alicia Sallers for a little while on academic reading preferences. This is uh, the topic of Diane's doctoral research but she's published a paper looking at the data of students in the US and their preferences for reading online during the pandemic. What I'm hoping to have out um, in the not too distant future is a comparison of what UK students said. Um, so watch this space if I can find any time to finish writing the article. But yeah, we've got a good quote here um, from um, uh, Diane and Alicia's article, which is really, um, you know, that uh, probably something that doesn't surprise us. So we're obviously talking about creating um, more ebooks, but many um, large percentages of learners reported completing their assigned academic readings less frequently during the pandemic. They also highlighted and annotated their texts less frequently. Um, small minorities reported favourable experiences of reading online, um, and um, as ever, recommending sort of further study to understand you know how we might better support students if what we're seeing is students increasingly doing online readings but it's fairly clear and it's fairly clear coming out of the UK data um, that students don't particularly like having to spend a lot of time staring at screens when they're doing their academic reading and they do still have preferences for print which is interesting and it's, i mean it's, it's relevant to the conversation about you know copyright and getting access to materials mm -hmm. because I think there's so much of a 
um, you know, focus on, well, you know, we should be enabling digital access to things, but actually we need to think about the people who are impacted by this and it's not just, you know, it's not just the legal. We might pick up on aspects. this uh, with our panel. Possibly, who See knows? What our panel you know. think about yes. yes, okay. So you mentioned the panel. I have mentioned the panel. So um, we are we are going to very shortly go over to our uh, start our panel discussion um, and we're absolutely delighted to have two fantastic speakers joining us today. So we have Lorna Campbell, who's the Learning Technology Services Manager at the University of Edinburgh, also um, somebody who's worked in open educational resources for um, quite some time. Um, Lorna's also got a blog about openness and knowledge equity, um, which I certainly read regularly, find it really valuable. Um, and then we have Dara Snowden, who's the textbook program manager at UCL Press, which is actually the UK's first fully open access university press. Um, Dara, before that, was working um, in publishing, uh, worked at um, Roman and Littlefield, um, and um, also at Edinburgh University Press and Bloomsbury Publishing. Um, and was a rising star in publishing in 2019 um, and still still is rising Dara right it's, it's it's really great to have you both with us um, I'm going to stop sharing slides for the time being um, because we are having more of a kind of panel discussion here aren't we so um, it would just be great if we can perhaps now go over to our, our speakers and if I can just ask you each if I can go to Lorna first maybe just can you just could you just really briefly say hi to everybody anything you want to add to the biography that I've just shared about you <laughs> of course uh, thanks for the introduction Jane it's uh, it's wonderful to be joining you again um, so as Jane said I, um, I currently work at the University of Edinburgh where I'm the manager of the Learning Technology Service. So I've worked as a learning technologist for, oh, since, since 1997. So um, I, don't to, I don't want to count how many years that is. Um, <laughs> I've been involved in the open education space since about um, 2009. Um, which is when, if you cast your minds back, some of you might remember a JISC programme called the UK Open Education Resources Programme. And that was really when I first started getting involved with uh, the whole idea of open education resources. And since then, it's something that I've had quite a sort of long standing personal commitment to is um, knowledge equity in particular. So it's the whole field of open knowledge, including open education practice, open education resources, and most recently open textbooks. Um, so yes, that, that's, that's kind of why I'm here today. Great, thank you. And um, Dara, would you like to just uh, introduce yourself briefly? Anything you want to add to what I said? Yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting me and, and I'm really happy to be here. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, great. Um, yeah, I, I I feel a little bit, and I have for the last year or so, feel like a little bit of an interloper because this this job, this role with UCL Press is my first ever job that's that's working within a fully OA capacity. Um, my background is in commercial academic publishing, but but as I was thinking about it, you know, my first ever job in in academic publishing was at Bloomsbury Academic, um, way back when Francis Pinter was in charge of of that portion of of publishing, and Francis went on to found knowledge unlatched and do a lot around open access um, and, and there were these kind of ongoing discussions happening at, at Bloomsbury Academic at the time that, that I was privy to and listening to and and so actually open access has sort of followed me through through my commercial publishing career uh, and then uh, yeah it feels like full circle now to be to be somewhere that's that's so committed to that practice uh, and trying to make it work as, as, a, as a fully open access university press that's great. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, really, really, um, you know, really looking forward to what you've both got to say. So what we're going to do, um, we, we mentioned in our copyright news a bit about the, the ebook SOS crisis, some of the problems that have been in the, the, the press recently about the Wiley books and things like that. Um, and I know that um, sort of uh, licensing and the kind of pricing of, of uh, 
textbooks is not either of your area but one of the things i'm wondering my sort of first question to you both is whether you think that the kind of recent resurgence in interest in open textbooks because you know it's as, as lorna said this movement started you know quite some time ago in the UK, GISC did a lot of work in 2009 to try to kind of kickstart interest in open educational resources. Um, and it kind of largely fell by the wayside. But I'm wondering, is it is it related to the kind of crisis in ebook pricing? Is it something to do with COVID? Um, and, you know, how much of these were a factor at, at your two institutions when you were sort of deciding you know, to, to launch open textbooks. Should we go Dara first? Is there anything you'd like yeah, to say sure. about that? Yeah, f for my programme, so the textbook programme at UCL Press, um, the pandemic was absolutely the catalyst for action. Um, mm. So the background is that, that to my understanding, uh, open access books had been on the radar for a few years. We had participated in that JISC project, the uh, institution as e-textbook publisher back in 2016, 2017. Um, uh, uh, and sort of dabbling with the idea, thinking about it, planning around it, but you know, no kind of strong push to to, to create something in that space. Um, but really, that that sharp pivot to, to e resources uh, and their high and often unpredictable pricing models um, really drove the need for a dedicated program of a sort of homegrown textbooks, homegrown alternatives to commercial yeah. provision. Um, UCL as an institution though has, has been doing work around kind of openness for a long time. We have an office of open science and scholarship um, and the press of course has been going for about seven years now with a, an established monograph program and a journals program. Um, but really the need for open access textbooks was, was really hammered home in 2020 as a, as a financial imperative for, for us yeah. as an institution to, to, to explore. Yeah. Lorna, what about Edinburgh? Um, again, quite, you've had quite a long history of um, working in the, the open education mm -hmm. sort of space. Mm -hmm. um, but was it something that drove it? You know, was it COVID? Was it? Um, yes and no. Sorry, my cat is trying oh, this. We have the cat. <laughs> yeah. always love a cat in a webinar. He's, he's also <laughs> extremely wet, so I'm trying to keep him playing on my face. <laughs> Um, sorry, yes. So, um, yeah, we've taken a slightly different approach at Edinburgh and I'm actually, I'm, I think one of the things you said that I think is quite interesting is that um, open education fell by the wayside after the, the GIST programme. I don't actually think that's the case, but I think, no. I think what we've seen in the UK is that most, a lot of open education initiatives are situated with learning technologists or yeah. with academics rather than in academic libraries who have been extremely successful in supporting open access and other forms of open publishing and in terms of the way we support openness in edinburgh it's, it really is something that is supported right across the institution. And I know that my colleague Eugen from the library is here today. I'm sure I saw his name on the list of delegates there. Yes. So um, Edinburgh University Library has done a huge amount of work supporting open access. There's a new open access, um, a new scholarly publishing policy that was published, um, that was shared just last year, I think, um, that really enshrines that commitment to open access. The, the library has also had a really successful open journal platform um, which hosts a wide range of open access student created journals that's been there for a number of years um, the open ebook press is much more recent um, that was set up i think um, two years ago um, and i think possibly partially in response to the pandemic mm. um, but there is a much wider commitment to open education in the institution as well. And the Open Education Resources Service is situated in a division called Learning, Teaching and Web Services, which is um, at the directorate of my colleague, Melissa Hyten, who some of you will know, and she's very much um, driven the university's vision for open knowledge. And um, the OER service has been there for, I think it's about six years now. And, we that service was really set up to 
um, encourage both staff and students right across the institution to engage with the creation and use of open education resources in many forms. So I think this commitment to openness um, is something that is very much ingrained in Edinburgh from way beyond, you know, prior prior to the pandemic. Um, yeah. But I think um, the refocusing on open textbooks is a more recent thing and is certainly bound up, I think, with the crisis in e-textbook costs. And also, I think, just um, the changes in education more widely. I mean, we all we all remember the great online pivot at the beginning of the pandemic. Well, you know, everything had to go online. And of course, that put more pressure on um, digital resources rather than physical resources. So these things have all, have all um, had an impact, I think. Yeah, Lorna. Right. Sorry, just to clarify, the 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 impetus for open educate that that kept going and has has been going at UCL mm -hmm. as well. I just meant in terms of, um, you know, a, a dedicated textbook mm -hmm. program. You yes. know, we sort yeah. of dabbled with the idea and um in in lots of different guises. Um, but yeah, similarly to Edinburgh, you know, UCL have have, have been flying that flag for for open education for, for long before the pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can, can I follow up a, a question around terminology? Um, because we've 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 talked about a lot of things. We talked about open education, open education resources. We're talking about open textbooks, open knowledge, open scholarship. I the team that I work in at the Bodleian is open scholarship support. Um, and I wonder whether interesting to hear you saying, Lorna, that actually that momentum has continued going. It's happening in different places within our higher education institutions and under different banners and under different names. I wonder whether you could reflect on what the differences are between those different things and, and is there is there a need to somehow link those things together conceptually among the people who actually have an influence here to, to keep that momentum mm -hmm. going and, and build on projects that are maybe in slightly different things, but they all can get some synergy or whatever kind of mm. word you want to use to, 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 to help get that movement. Yeah, okay. I mean, if we're where to start untangling all that, I mean, that's, okay. um, there's, there's all kinds of issues in there. Um, part of it, I mean, there has traditionally been a bit of a divide between the open education world and the open access world for various reasons. I think one of those reasons is the way that our institutions are organized here in the UK. Mm. Just, you know, they're, they're, the, the academic library tends to have a distinct identity and governance structure. Yeah. Learning technologists tend to be situated in different places in our institution. They're sometimes more scattered across our institutions. Um, there have been different policies that, you know, there are open that open access policies exist driven by the research councils. Open education resource policies are, are, are less common and they don't, they tend not to have this real sort of top down push. Um, I, I think also, um, again, you know, going back into history, I should, I should confess here that my, my academic background is actually in archaeology. <laughs> So I always tend to sort of <laughs> look a bit to you know the past and where we came from. Um, even before the JISC Open Education Resources Program, there was a program called the Digital Repositories Program, and that was a program that was responsible for providing seed funding for a lot of digital repositories in institutions. I think that was around about 2007, 2008. Mm. And there was a strand of that program that tried to um, build digital repositories for open education resources in institutions yeah. and it didn't really work because open education resources are a very wide class of things you know it could be anything from yeah. a single photograph a simulation a 3d model to an entire course mm -hmm. there um whereas scholarly works are a more homogenous type of thing they have a defined lifespan and they tend to have an endpoint. So there's a lot of things mixed up there that I think, um, and I think in a way it's been, it's it's been unfortunate that we have ended up with these two silos that we have the open access stuff going on in the library, we have the open education um, resource, resource and open practice stuff going on in 
well, quite often scattered across the institution. Um, and I would certainly see this resurgence of interest in open textbooks as potentially a way that we can actually bring these two domains back together, which I think really is, is what we need to be doing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just reflecting on the fact <clears throat> that um, we don't tend in the UK to have um, a, a, a position which you increasingly see in US university mm -hmm. libraries, which is an OER librarian. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, and that, it's, that, yeah, yeah, I think that is a missing piece, perhaps. I think it's, and that's a whole, a sort of whole other thing is the the, yeah. dis the distinction between um, the conception and the reality of open education resources in North America and in the UK and Europe more widely. And the, the way textbooks are used in higher education is very different in North America and in the UK and North America, both in the US and in Canada, courses tend to be very reliant on a single astronomically expensive textbook. And these costs are prohibitive and actually do prevent people from accessing higher education. So the OER movement in the US has for many, many years been focused on the provision of open access textbooks, mm. of open textbooks, because that is a place where they can make a real difference to students' access to education. And colleagues in the US have been incredibly successful in doing that. I mean, if you look at the work of an organization such as Spark, for example, um, and you know, work up by you know funded by the, the Hewlett Foundation, promoted by Creative Commons, huge amount of really successful work creating and promoting open textbooks. Here in the UK, textbooks are used quite differently, and quite often it's the library that bears the brunt of the cost of textbooks. And courses may use multiple textbooks rather than rely on one single one. So I think because the way textbooks are used is different between the US and the UK. We haven't seen um, the big push for open textbooks that occurred in the US. And therefore we don't have um, OER librarians. I think having OER, if, if a whole kind of raft of OER librarians was suddenly to materialize in the UK, <laughs> I'm not sure how much that would change things immediately because the way we use resources is still quite different. But I do think that, um, like I said before, I think we are at a point now where we really need to look at, um, at access to resources. And I think there's a lot of knowledge in the learning technology community about providing access to open licensed teaching and learning materials that I really hope will filter into the library space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I just reflect on the fact that I've worked most of my career sitting between libraries and learning technology, but it is, it's quite a, it's actually quite a small space in some ways. Mm -hmm. There's not a huge amount of crossover. And one of the yeah. things we've tried to do is actually to bring those two communities together yeah. 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 Through, through the webinars, through the, the old special interest group. I, I wonder if I could um, ask Dara, if you could, would you be able to talk about um, kind of the culture that you have at UCL, what, what's allowed you to, to, to get, I mean, you mentioned before about and, and the, the background and the history of having the UCL Press and very strong open access publishing. Um, but leading on from what Lorna was saying about not necessarily having OER librarians, that's not necessarily the thing that's going to make the difference. For you, what, what has made the difference for you? I don't know whether as part of that you want to share some examples of, of some of the projects that you've been working on. Yeah, absolutely. So UCL Press is it sits within library services. So we have a really close connection to UCL's lib librarians and, and, and services provided there. Um, and in terms of kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. having access to, you know, my job is made easier by being able to point to our established programs within the press. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not having to um, start from scratch a lot of the times when I'm speaking to teaching faculty or academics certainly not to librarians who already know a, a lot about what, what it is we're doing um, about open access um, so it coming again sort of from a commercial publishing perspective into this new kind of OA space I'm having to do a lot of both so I'm having to be an advocate for 
open access publishing, why it's beneficial for both your, you know, the author, the reader, the ecosystem, um, for, for those that are not sort of, you know, that, that are still sort of navigating that space, as well as commissioning textbook content in a, in a more traditional sense. So trying to identify where there are challenges or specific needs within a, a module or a discipline, um, you know, where we can perhaps, you know, where there might be opportunity to create something that um, that, that offers a stu offers students um, an enhanced way of learning, a different way of learning. Um, so doing all of that kind of mapping and workshopping of, of um, you know, whether there's a gap in the market for us to create something, whether we can create something OA that could could potentially kind of compete or be a, a really high quality alternative to a commercial provision. Um, so that kind of, you know, uh, investigating as well as um, a, a lot of kind of educating, um, you know, uh, authors and academics about uh, all of the um, all of the various things that are involved in open access. So things like license, you know, lots of questions around um, licensing and copyright and permissions and how does that, you know, how does that work if I'm going to produce something uh, open access? Um, so it's it's sort of a two part process. It's sort of trying to work with them to find opportunities for textbooks and then really sort of um, selling them on the idea of, of, of it being open access um, and again I can point to a lot of places within our institution that that offer guidance and policy so open science has a lot of um, a lot of uh, policy around that that can help sort of guide a, a, an author through that process as well um, but yeah so, so it's sort of that that um, that balance Absolutely, and I see that there are some some questions here. Evelyn's asked about academic publications and the difference between publications that are going to help uh, academics with career progression. Lorna agreeing with that, and, and and Tom also coming in about the emphasis on on high metric outputs. So, um, in what you've just described here, you're talking to people, you're doing the kind of hearts and minds approach, you're convincing them that it's the right thing to do. Uh, to what extent? Are there actually incentives within the UCL career progression thing that support being involved in in textbooks and, and education resources rather than just focusing on your you know high high value monograph or whatever it is? Yeah, I mean that's been our struggle from 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 you know the first sort of experimentation with open textbooks versus our, our more established monograph program. You know there is a clear incentive structure to publish research in in that in that way, um, but but not not as much in terms of uh, open education resources or, or indeed specifically what I'm doing, open textbooks. Um, so we've had to do a lot of kind of consultation with teaching faculty uh, and various members within in, uh, UCL to, to identify what would be a kind of sufficient incentive. Um, uh, and we've sort of landed on a bit of a balance between um, financial remuneration so a lot of authors particularly in stem disciplines that that would perhaps traditionally go to a commercial publisher would receive you know moderate to substantial royalties for their mm. for their work um, yeah. and that's always been a huge challenge you know uh, in between the sort of JISC project and, and me starting, you know, that, that we've had a few sort of open calls for textbook um, proposals, uh, and very few kind of have come through to us because, yeah, there, there's no clear in incentive to to opt for publishing it as as an open access publication versus a, a commercial textbook. Um, so, so we do have a, a flat fee model for our authors. We're we're working on that at the moment, and and um, you know, every time we commission a new author, we're asking for their feedback on that on that pricing structure and, and, and flat fee model. So we are having to invest in that, um, but also um, widening some of our promotion criteria. So at the moment, there is specific wording that relates to open research, um, uh, particularly within within the sciences, but but making sure that we have reference to that also in um, uh, for, for those on teaching teaching contracts, that yeah. participation and authorship of of open access textbooks can contribute to to you know a portion of of that um, promotion criteria and framework for them to uh, demonstrate that that commitment to openness, which UCL is is you know really wants to encourage. Yeah, 
would you would you like um, i mean you've got a couple of textbook examples haven't you on slides which um i could just i could just put up to just show people <laughs> who aren't familiar um if i just I'll just share those now briefly um and then maybe you could just yeah talk us through so happy to talk you through very quickly yeah absolutely so um, we pu we've published three textbooks today. Two of them have been as part of this this JISC project back in 2016, 2017, um, and one that's come in a bit later from from an open call for for textbooks. Um, and as you can see, there our, our kind of most successful in terms of of downloads has been the textbook of plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, this project came to us pretty much fully formed. So we were very lucky to be able to work with um, the three editors and that the, they had put together, you know, a, a roster of, of fantastic contributors um, and, and had this book in mind uh, and, and really wanted it to be open access. So it was fortuitous that we had this, you know, we, we were part of this project and could fund it in that way. Um, so I've just put some of those stats down for you as well to 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 show um, uh, total downloads to date. We are tracking where it's being accessed in terms of countries and te territories. Um, and for mo I'd say most of our books, with the exception of some of our enhanced e-books, um, of which you know we have we have only a handful. Um, all, all of our open access books are also available to purchase as um, print on demand. So we are sort of also keeping an eye on on kind of who who would who wants them as as print copies uh, and providing that to to um, to an audience that that is willing to you know to to pay um, a, a print price for those. Um, and we work out our print prices to um, be competitive in the market, but also just to cover costs of, of production um, uh, and printing um, so we're, we're not um, looking for profit from those from those print editions yeah. um, I'll just move on to the next slide very quickly so the other book that we published in partnership with JISC is this key concepts in public archaeology now, one um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a very different a very different kind of textbook from from the medical sciences textbook it's more within kind of arts humanities social sciences um it's an edited collection um that would look more familiar you know to a lot of people as a, a as a kind of more upper level undergraduate postgraduate level textbook again it's done it's done really well it's hard to benchmark we don't really have um yeah we, we, it's hard to compare um, but you know, to, to our to our minds, this is this is a textbook that's done that's done very well. Um, and then uh, introduction to Nordic cultures. That's a, a text that came to us. Again, the author um, uh, submitted that proposal to us after we we did a we did a call for textbooks back in sort of 2019 2020. Um, and and this was kind of one of one of the ones that came to us. Um, not a huge response rate for that for that call. Um, for submit uh, for for textbook proposals at that time, uh, and a lot of the you know we were asking lots of people sort of uh, you know why and um, you know uh, uh, lots around kind of a lack of incentives to to write textbooks, but also um, timing. You know, teaching faculty are juggling many many things, and um, and trying yeah. to get them to, to write a text is 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 tricky. Um, where we found traction has been author, have been authors who are in in the process of putting something together for a commercial press and have heard about our program and are interested in exploring an open access alternate you know a pathway to publishing um, yeah. so sort of catching them at that stage where they've kind of already got a, a project in mind um, and and they they're ready to sort of commit some time to it and then you know hopefully we can we can um, talk to them about what it would look like if if they published it as open access yeah yeah, thanks. That's really, really interesting, Dara. Lorna, do you want to perhaps say a bit about um, how things have worked at Edinburgh? Because you've got um, an open textbook on music education, haven't you? Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll go to some questions, I think, because uh, mm -hmm. we've got we've got we've got a bit of time and we've got plenty of questions popping up in the chat there so Lorna yeah mm -hmm. yeah I mean I can't comment too much on how the the, the, the open press um, at Edinburgh is, is based in the library, as I said, um, the OER service is based in a different bit of information services, so I'm not sure what the um, 
the strategic drivers were when it was set up and if they have plans going forward in the future for for doing the kind of um thing that dana has been talking about in terms of potentially you know putting out open calls or, or commissioning content the way that the press is set up it's called edinburgh diamond and it's based on the open monograph press is that it is very much a hosting platform rather than a publishing platform per se. Um, so, for example, it will do my colleague um, Rebecca Wojtarska, who manages the service, who is um, unfailingly helpful and a really fabulous colleague. She can do all the assistance of, um, you know, getting the content onto the platform and assigning ISBNs and um, cataloging the open textbooks. But you need to go to the press with the actual textbook itself. So right. the project that I was involved in was actually to create a textbook from existing open education resources, because one of the real drivers for um, putting so much funding into open education at the University of Edinburgh is sustainability. We want to ensure that the resources are both our staff and our students create are sustainable and contribute to this wider pool of open knowledge. So what we did was we took some content that had originally been created for a MOOC. Oh, I can't remember how long ago. I mean, this MOOC is about, I think, almost 10 years old, called The Fundamentals of Music Theory. The content from that MOOC had already been repurposed for an on-campus course. So um, some of the academics involved in the MOOC took the content, adapted it, added to it, and started using it for teaching an on-campus course for undergraduate students. We then took that content and the original MOOC content and readapted it again to co-create an open textbook with academics from the School of Music and also student interns. So it was very much a sort of student co-creation project. And it was actually funded by a very small um, uh, student experience grant at the university. That's a fund that we have for students to do all kinds of projects. Um, so we created the textbook together from scratch. Um, and then we took it to our colleagues in the library who were able to, who were very, very keen to, um, to host the textbook on Edinburgh Diamond. And it was actually mm. the first um, ebook that the platform launched with. Um, and it's been really interesting to see um, the response to that textbook. We thought it would, you know, we thought some people would be interested in it, but we were quite astonished by the number of downloads that it was getting quite rapidly, um, which, you know, were in the thousands within a month or so. Um, so that was very much an experimental project to see, could we do this? Could you take existing legacy content? and turn it into an ebook. And what we found was, yes, you can, and you can be very successful doing that, but the overhead creating that ebook is quite significant. Um, and I think for that model to become sustainable, we would need to look at how we could support academic colleagues uh, to do that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, there's an interesting question that, that Kate's put into the chat, sort of aimed primarily at Dara, but I mean, I, I think it's worth, Lorna, you commenting on as well. I mean, you, I don't think you do have librarianship at University of Edinburgh, do you? It's, it's, it's not taught as a subject. Um, but Kate's asking if, if, you know, the sort of strong link between the press, the library is helped by librarianship being kind of seen as a credible academic subject. I don't know. Do you think that is, do you think that is an issue? Do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I think it does yeah. help. Um, yeah, it's tricky for me to comment on that and on that in particular. But um, yeah, I think establishing those, you know, the fact that we sit within that that team, you know, we're, we're part of the 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 UCL's library services structure, um, just yeah. just gives us just gives everyone else in that team a lot more access to us and and what it is we're doing and um, and 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 collaborating within our decision making so we have a lot of library services colleagues that are on our publishing boards um, so so they're you know they're, they're, they're part of kind of our, our um, our management and, and decision making uh, and vice versa you know we consult um, uh, they'll consult with us uh, also about kind of um, e you know e-textbook issues and things like that um, 
but yeah I, is there also a link with the you know when people are learning about publishing and publishing studies because that's also something that that's UCL right does. we do so yeah I, I, is there is there some collaboration between that um i guess different sectors that are often seen or often find themselves on opposite sides of a fence is there is it something that in terms of the culture of the institution has managed to find a way mm -hmm. For, for you know for there to be a meaningful collaboration between people who have different yeah that's a really good point yeah we, we we um in our journals program we also have a few student journals that, that are generated from um some of the content that that um and research that the publishing ma is is doing um right. they have access to us as well in terms of um you know being able to contact us and, and and vice versa we do a lot of um uh, uh workshops and things with that with that ma group so they have access to a kind of working uh university press as part of their um as part of their course as well so there's yeah there is quite a lot of collaboration there as well um and again it sort of supports that eco ecosystem yeah, I mean, having been lucky enough to visit UCL and talk to some of the library students and talking to, to the lecturers there, I know copyright when it gets covered in the library studies module is looked at from quite a different perspective as it is on the publishing MA. So it's interesting to see how, you know, it's certainly with an institution actually doing something instrumental, you've managed to take advantage of, of having both. Yeah. There are some other questions, but we are we have 10 minutes left yeah we? So i mean i guess my final question i would quite like to ask was um related to some of the studies that we highlighted that are being done about student reading preferences i don't know lorna are you familiar with some of that work and what 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 what, what do you think of of the idea that are we creating a lot of online content that students actually might not necessarily want to engage with i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure i've struggled to answer that question to be honest the sort of my engagement in that area tends to be more um with students creating content um yeah so you've which, got some really engaged students haven't yeah you, which, is, which is actually something that um where we put a lot more focus on is trying to work with students to create open knowledge so that the students are themselves are creating um open content because there's so much incredible i mean if you think of the the amount of work that students create through the course of their um you know academic studies and that so much of that material just disappears into a black hole it's never to be seen again so one of the things mm -hmm. that we're very committed to in edinburgh is trying to surface um as much of that content as we can um through a wide range of sort of open education and the curriculum initiatives so that we're actually um working with students so that they are creating content that can be reused yeah. completely sort of like avoiding your question um but no, no, I think it's that's an area though, that because I think, quite some success I think, I think reading can be quite passive can't it and actually what you're doing is actively engaging students in the knowledge creation so rather than yeah. just consuming you know yeah, it's so read and yeah. that, that that whole sort of um information literacy space is absolutely yeah. key to what we're doing and so we have a number of courses where students are creating open education resources we also have our wikimedia and the curriculum uh, program absolutely. that's been very successful and it really is about teaching students how knowledge is created and consumed online and to encourage them to start to create open knowledge as well yeah and might i also suggest that part of the issue with student reading preferences um, has a lot to do with proprietary platforms of restrictively licensed content forcing them to consume it in a particular way yeah, whereas one right. of the values of, of open educational resources is that the source material is there to be reused remixed and put into ways that actually can be incorporated by teachers Absolutely. by students themselves into into a more mm. helpful and meaningful way um, yeah just a thought yeah any any sort of final any final thoughts from you dara we're, we're approaching the end any yeah i was just listening to lorna speak about empowering students to create open open content which is yeah fantastic and um it's a bit trickier for for me and my program because we are you know we, we are sort of i wouldn't say restricted but structured in a very kind of publishing you know in, in a way that 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 um 
asks the question kind of what what kind of publishing intervention is is needed in that um, we, we've been having a lot of conversations also about repositories and how we host content and and what what we're hosting and where um, with the press it's it's really important for us to be able to track downloads so that has yeah. dictated kind of where 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 we can put stuff um, you know within that parameter you know we want it to try and be as uh, be accessed as widely as possible but um part of our remit is to is to track those downloads and so um a lot of our content is is produced in a relatively traditional e-format of, of pdf and um you know things that jstor will take <laughs> um uh so so you know sort of opening opening up kind of more discussion around different kinds of content is is something we're doing at the moment and trying to figure out how we can um yeah how we can host it where we can put it and and what we're able to track from that um and, no and decisions yet <laughs> no 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 and, and the, i think the thing that is i think related to that is the question that's been running in the chat about how you actually update the resources so perhaps the final point and perhaps for both dara and lorna and thinking about this Dara, the question there is about how you ensure that your resources are kept up to date. I suppose in some ways that's similar to tr traditional publishing, where you look at new editions and look at how you change them. That's but you're saying you're integrating a revision and new edition process into what you do. Yeah, so again, very, very similar to sort of how other publishers would do it. Um, so we will be looking at, you know, which commercial textbooks are on a revision cycle if we're producing something that is is competitive to that we need to make sure that we're keeping up with that also so that you know we're not um you know we're not having uh, our textbook being used for a few years until you know a commercial a commercial publisher has a new edition with updated content so we have to keep keep within that process but also being mindful of the kinds of topics we're publishing on so whether they are um whether they include a lot of policy that changes a lot, whether there are, you know, within STEM and sciences, um, whether there are kind of lots of discoveries happening all the time that, that mean that that content does need to be kept up to date, you know, once every year or two years, and making sure that our we manage expectations with our authors about that also, so that they they know when they start a pro the process of, of, of publishing with us as an open access textbook author that, that we will be kind of calling on them to provide updates um, you know as and when the content needs revision also soliciting feedback from people that are using the book um, whether they would benefit from from additional content and, and having that be part of our process of um, uh, are thinking about revision and a and, and new edition. So what can we add that will make this more accessible or more usable? Um, uh, trying to solicit, solicit that kind of feedback once we once we publish the initial book. Um, so, so that kind of feedback loop um, yeah. will form part of, of, of how we how we think about new editions as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And, yeah. and, and Lorna, from your perspective, is there anything you would add to your experience of ensuring that content is kept up to date or people are aware that it you know you can't just do something openly and leave it there or, or how, how well, does it work in your context? I think I mean there are two aspects to that on the the um the open press side so, so Edinburgh Diamond is underpinned by uh, open monograph press um which I believe does have built-in um version control and again that is um that's managed by our colleagues in the library and in actual fact the music textbook is currently we're preparing the second edition of that and we'll pass that over to um, our colleague Rebecca and she will manage that um, that update on the other side of things I think there is an aspect that you do have to accept that when you release something under open license to some extent it's it's gone and there's only so much you can do to track how that resource is used ethically. There are very unethical ways you can track content across the web. But if you want to be open and transparent, there is a certain amount of, of letting go that you have to do and accept that once mm. you make an open license resource available for download and reuse under open license, people can do all kinds of things with it that you will never know about. Yeah. Um, so we do us we do some tracking of our you know wide broad spread of open education resources we have multiple repositories we put content all over the web we share it wherever it will be useful and it's not that we do no monitoring at all we certainly do you know like to know if people are using our resources um but 
I think we're probably we do much less of that than um, the the kind of more formal monitoring that that Dara was talking about. Thank you so You're much. You're so right, yeah. Lorna. Once you publish it, it is you know to to some extent it is just out yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Let it go. Let okay. it go. Let it go. There's a song. There is. Let's not, let's not do that song. No, um, we're nearly getting to twelve o'clock. Well, so, we are. We yeah. are pretty much on twelve o'clock. So yeah. I think um, we think we should wrap things up. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you both so much yeah. for your time. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Really. I think we could have talked for another thing. hour. Even you know. We, we went in some different ways to the discussion we had at the OER 22 conference as well, but it's been really useful. So I, thank I would you. also note that we didn't necessarily talk that much about copyright, which is really the, the, the topic ten, tends <gasps> to be of these webinars. Um, but I think it's something that clearly there's 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 you know, things that we may come back to. And certainly if we're talking about third party copyright content within open Absolutely. education resources, there's a whole discussion there. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's certainly that's going to be happening. Yeah. Um, but Thank you again so much for, yeah, for joining you. us. Thank um, you. If anyone has any questions, presumably they would be able to contact you if they want. You know, you're Absolutely. happy to talk to others about what you've done. If anyone wants to emulate that, I'm certainly very interested in working out how we can incorporate what you've done at your respective institutions um, into into where we work at the Bodley. Um, so we'll see how things would progress. But thank yeah. You again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I think. That just leaves us um, with uh, a couple of slides before everyone rushes off to go and grab their lunch uh, with some future webinar dates that we've got coming up. Um, we mentioned at our last webinar two weeks ago the IFLA publication that's called Navigating Copyright for Libraries. And what we're hoping is we're going to have two webinars from um, some editors and authors who contributed to that open access book. Um, which is uh, going to be on the 11th of November and the 2nd of December. But kind of watch this space because we're we're just in discussion with the editors to find out who might be able to join us um, for those sessions. Um, and otherwise, it'll just be you and I talking about our chapter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you could do the first one. I'll do the second one. Yeah, we could break it up into yeah. and slice it into really small parts That's and it. stretch it Let's out. Do it like our, that. Our webinar yeah. We've also got an exciting Christmas special lined up on the 16th of December. Yeah. One of our copyright padawans is a bit of a quiz quiz genius and is going to be a star of tv quiz shows only connect as yes well. absolutely yes, yes. highbrow tv quiz yes shows. and i love the fact that you put that there's a james birthday special coming in january it is yeah, especially yeah. the day before my birthday well it, but that's the date of the webinar there'll right? be cake won't there well, yeah let's see fantastic okay so we're just going to leave people with uh one last thing one last thing before they rush off or if they haven't already gone they may okay. well have done yeah okay one last thing tell us about this chris what's going on many here? of you will have seen uh, or heard the podcast that we did with mark lewison beatles expert number one greatest beatles expert in the world um who is this evening and tomorrow uh performing his own show Evolver 62, which is the story of, of 1962, the Beatles 1962, uh, through a number of objects. Um, it's fascinating. Jane and I had the privilege of being able to see in the preview show. We did, um, yeah. So yeah. there are still tickets remaining if you are able to get to London and able to get Take to... Take tickets tomorrow. Tomorrow, night. to the Bloomsbury Theatre. Once again, another UCL connection there. Yeah. Um, it's a great show. And I, I had the privilege of performing performing with mark this was <laughs> what the weekend before last it was uh it's a, an event that jane you've been instrumental in arranging a beatles tribute mark spoke at it i think and you're actually is... playing love me do at that point aren't mm, you yes i think so yes, yes. yeah yeah and um, mark's on the tambourine and singing indeed yeah with you that's and your me, friend me and my friend anthony and we did some we did some beatly three-part heart it was an, in, incredible yeah. maybe maybe that'll be what he does to earn himself a few bob on his next tour. But genuinely, if you if you have anyone that is interested in the Beatles, uh, the people that are remaining, it is it's a fantastic show. Yeah, um, and really there are good. tickets available if you can somehow get into London on the train strike day tomorrow. Yes, yes. So I think that's all from us. Yep. Um, we will just stop the recording. Um, but thank you again to Dara and Lorna for joining us this morning.